Merry Christmas, Trinity family and special guests. My name is Joshua, and I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity. I, too, want to welcome you to our online Christmas celebration. Uh, Even those of you who got guilted into watching, I've been a pastor for 24 years, so I know how this sometimes works. Uh, But as long as we're here, we might as well receive what God has for us. And I do believe that God has something for us tonight as we wrap up our Christmas series, Why Jesus Came, looking tonight at one final reason that Jesus came to earth, which was to give us a gift. Now, I know Christmas gifts are supposed to be fun, but how many of you have ever been offended by a gift that someone gave to you? Because their gift to you came with an agenda for you. Let me give you a few examples of offensive Christmas gifts that actual people have received. Uh, First off is the cleaning supply gift basket, which basically comes with an unwritten card that says, your house is a pigsty, here's a gift to help you not be such a slob. Uh, Another actual Christmas gift is the exercise gift bag, which also comes with an unwritten card that says, You're kind of fat, not very strong. Here's a gift to help you get in shape. And probably my favorite offensive Christmas gift is the book Selfishness and Self-Absorption, which also comes with an unwritten card attached that basically says, you're obnoxious and ruining all of your relationships. Here's a gift to help you not be such a jerk. Gifts like these are tough to receive in part because of the unwritten cards that come with them. Think about it. If you say thank you so much to the person who is giving you an exercise bag and a gift on how to overcome your selfishness and self-absorption, in a sense, you are admitting, yeah, I'm overweight and selfish and bad at relationships. Merry Christmas to you too. Uh, Even those offensive gifts that we know we need are difficult to receive Because receiving them means swallowing our pride and admitting that we need help, which is not easy for many of us, which leads me to another potentially offensive gift, the gift that God came to give us. The gift that God came to give us. Now, I know it might sound strange to think of God giving us a gift that is offensive, but I want you to listen to Matthew's version of the Christmas story and see if you can spot why this gift might offend some folks. Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, reads this way. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, and her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. Did you catch God's Christmas gift to us? The gift that carries with it a message that might sound offensive to some ears. If you didn't, it's in bold and bright red on the screen. God's Christmas gift is that Jesus came to save us from our sins. Jesus came to save us from our sins so that we could be reconciled to God, so that we could become children of God, so that we could become filled with the Spirit of God, so that we could become heirs in the kingdom of God, which on the one hand is the greatest gift ever given. On the other hand, it's one of those gifts that comes with a card attached that is offensive to many people because the gift of being saved from our sins implies that we're a mess in need of saving. Tim Keller says this, there has never been a gift offered that makes you swallow your pride to the depths that the gift of Jesus Christ requires us to do. Christmas means we are so lost, so unable to save ourselves, that nothing less than the death of the Son of God himself could save us. In other words, 
to receive God's Christmas gift, we have to admit that we are lost sinners. We have to admit that before a holy God, none of us is good enough. None of us is moral enough to save ourselves. We have to admit that we needed God to come to earth to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. And by the way, that's exactly what the card that's attached to God's Christmas gift would say. Now, I know most Christmas cards don't say, Merry Christmas, lost sinner, God came to save you. Because Hallmark wouldn't sell very many Christmas cards if they wrote the cards out that way. But that's what the Christmas story actually says. That God came to earth to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. The Christmas story begins with this claim that God came to earth in the person of Jesus to save us. The very first thing the angel tells Joseph is that the baby inside Mary's womb is God. Look again at verse 20. It says, An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. The first thing this angel tells Joseph is that the baby inside Mary's womb is not from some guy, but from God. Conceived by the Holy Spirit. This would have been a very important detail for God to relay to Joseph because Joseph knew that this baby was not his baby, that he was not this baby's daddy, which is why he was ready to break off this engagement with Mary. But the angel here tells Joseph not to do that because God is the father of this baby. God is the father of this baby. In other words, if a DNA test were done, there would be no dad match on earth. Because the baby was conceived by God, making this baby God's son, the second person of the Trinity, Emmanuel, God with us. And to drive this point home about Jesus being God with us, Matthew says this happened in fulfillment of a prophecy foretold by the prophet Isaiah some 700 years earlier. Look at verse 22. Matthew continues, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Now, at this point, let me hit pause and say something to those of you who think this whole idea of God becoming a baby seems very far-fetched. Join the club. Join the club. You know who else thought this idea of God being born of a virgin sounded far-fetched? The first century Jewish leaders, many of whom interpreted this prophecy about a virgin birth figuratively, metaphorically, that it was simply Isaiah's way of saying that one day a great leader would be born through whom God would work so powerfully that it would be like God is with us. The Jewish people were not inclined to believe a baby would be conceived by God, by the Holy Spirit. In fact, the first century religious leaders explained Mary's pregnancy the same way our culture would explain it. In John chapter 8, they accused Jesus of being illegitimate. Illegitimate, which is exactly what our culture would assume if some teenager got pregnant and claimed that God was the father. No first century Jew was naturally inclined to believe that Jesus was literally God, born of a virgin. No, it actually took Jesus not only claiming to be God, but then rising from the dead in order to convince his Jewish followers that he was literally God with them, that he was literally Emmanuel. Now, of course, the question still remains, why would God become a baby in the first place? Why would God become a baby in the first place? I mean, in the Old Testament, God often revealed his presence and his power through things like a pillar of fire or even a plague as this way to manifest his power or this way to bring judgment against sin. 
So why would God now take on the form of a vulnerable, helpless little baby? A helpless little baby. Why would God come in that way? Why would God come as a baby? Well, because God's coming was not about bringing judgment, but about bearing judgment, taking upon himself the just judgment for our sin so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to himself. See, God came to earth in Jesus to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, save us. The angel tells Joseph that is Jesus' mission. In verse 21, he will save his people from their sins. That was Jesus' mission. He will save his people from their sins. And 33 years after that first Christmas, Jesus fulfilled the purpose for which he was born, going to the cross and taking upon himself the just judgment for the sin that we deserved. Right? Loving us so much that he was willing to take our place, giving his life for ours. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then three days later, he rose from the dead as proof that what happened on that cross really is sufficient for those who trust in him to be forgiven and to receive this new life. In other words, when we give Jesus our sin and ourselves, he gives us forgiveness and new life, which is a really good exchange. It's a really good exchange. In fact, that's why Martin Luther called this the sweetest exchange. The sweetest exchange. I'm sure most of you have done a Christmas gift exchange you know, where you give somebody a scarf and, and they give you a, a pair of socks or something. Typically, Christmas gift exchanges are fairly even in terms of the cost to both parties. Well, the gift exchange between God and us is not like that. See, we give God the ugly Christmas sweater of sin and shame, and he buys us forgiveness and eternal life with his own shed blood. That's why it's called the sweetest exchange. The sweetest exchange. And it's available to anyone who has the courage to enter into a relationship with Jesus as Savior and Lord. And yes, I'm using that word courage very intentionally. See, there is courage required to admit that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Because there's something in the human heart that's afraid to admit wrongdoing. It's why most of us have a hard time apologizing or owning our mistakes, even with other people. Even with other people. It takes courage to admit that we've messed up, both with other human beings and ultimately with God. But there's no other way to receive this gift of forgiveness and new life from God apart from courageously admitting that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And then courageously signing on to follow Jesus, even if it means becoming a social outcast in our culture. Which is not a new thing, friends. I mean, that's what Joseph courageously signed on for, too in his culture. Think about it. When the angel tells Joseph to marry his pregnant girlfriend and raise this baby of whom he is not the father, the implications for Joseph in that culture, if he marries her, are that his reputation will be mud and he will become a social outcast for the rest of his life. All of Joseph's friends, family, peers, they're going to think that either he got Mary pregnant before they were married, which was a big deal in that culture, or that he is a naive schmuck because he doesn't even realize that she was unfaithful to him, which was also a big deal in that culture. 
Can you imagine Joseph trying to explain the story to his family and friends and townspeople? Oh, it's not what you think, guys. The father of Mary's baby is actually God. Oh, yeah, of course, Joseph, right. God is the dad, right. Everyone would have thought Joseph to be either a promiscuous liar or a naive fool. Either way, Joseph signing on to a relationship with Jesus in his culture required him to relinquish his reputation and become a social outcast for the rest of his life. And friends, that is not unlike what some of us need to be prepared for in our culture. If we go all in with Jesus, then we too, like Joseph, will need courage to relinquish our reputation, especially in a society that will view us as backward, bigoted, narrow-minded, and offensive. There is no other way, though, to receive the gift that God has for us apart from courageously relinquishing our reputation admitting that we are sinners in need of a Savior, and then courageously relinquishing our reputation in the face of a culture that is increasingly hostile to the person and teaching of Christ. And so the question this Christmas is this. Will you receive the gift that God is offering you? Or will you be so offended by the card attached to that gift that you pass on the greatest gift ever given. Let me ask that question one more time. Will you receive the gift that God is offering you? Or will you be so offended by the card that's attached to it that you take a pass on the greatest gift ever given? Before I wrap up this message and you unwrap presents, I want to invite you to take a few moments to reflect on and then respond to this incredible gift that God offers us. And to guide our response, there will be some next steps on the screen. Here's the first one. If you've never received this gift that God offers, maybe tonight is the night you receive God's gift. Humbling yourself before God acknowledging that you're a sinner who needs a Savior, and then putting your trust in Jesus, receiving Him as your Savior, surrendering your heart to Him as Lord, so that He can not only save you from your sins, but that He could lead you into the life that He's created you to live. What better day to receive God's incredible gift of forgiveness and new life than on Christmas? And on the day when we celebrate his birth and remember why he came, maybe that's your next step tonight. If it is, then I would encourage you to tell someone after this service or declare it at tefs.org slash live, tapping on the My Next Step button so that the staff and the prayer team can pray for you and so that we can get you connected with resources that will encourage you in this journey with God. Now, if you've already received God's gift of forgiveness and new life through Christ, here are three other potential next steps that I would encourage you to consider this Christmas. Thank God for his gift. Thank God for his gift. Just like we say thank you when when someone gives us a gift, when a family member or a friend gives us a gift, let's take a few moments during our reflection song to tell God thank you for his gift of Christ, to take a few moments to give God thanks for what he's done for us through Christ. Thank God for his gift. Thank God for his gift. Another next step is to pray for someone who still needs God's gift. Again, let's spend a few moments during our reflection song asking God to open their eyes to their need for a Savior and to perhaps give us an opportunity to point them to Jesus 
to ask God to open up a door for us to talk to them about Jesus, to share with them how much Jesus loves them and, and how he came to save them. Maybe that's a next step for some of us, to take some time during this reflection song, to pray, to ask God to open up the eyes of those who still need his gift. And then finally, another next step is to give in response to God's gift. To give in response to God's gift through our Christmas offering as we raise money for Camp Raybird here in South Bend and for our missionaries in Nepal, two ministries that are serving those whom the world so often overlooks. Giving to Camp Raybird and giving to the Ingalls Ministry in Nepal is Trinity Church's birthday gift to Jesus. After all, Jesus himself said, when you give to the needy, when you give to the least of these, you're really giving to me. You're really giving to me. And so if you haven't yet gotten a gift for Jesus this Christmas, this is a gift that fits that description. There are two ways for you to take this particular next step. Number one, you can give online at tefs.org slash advent dash offering. Or if you'd prefer, you can mail your offering to the office. Just be sure to write advent offering on your check so that we know how to direct it. Again, what better way to give a birthday gift to Jesus than by giving to these two ministries that are sharing the hope of the gospel with vulnerable and at-risk children. Well, as the worship team comes to share a special song, again, I want to invite you to take a few moments to reflect on God's gift of Jesus and then respond by taking any or all of these next steps. Receive God's gift. Spend a few moments thanking God for his gift. Pray for someone who still needs God's gift. And then give in response to God's gift. Whatever next step you need to take in response to God's great gift, take it. Take it. Let's pray.